All right, so our next session is Advancing Health Equity Through Population Health Practice and Data Analytics. Um, we have a panel of uh, three experts up here to share about what they're doing within their organization. Um, and our very own Chief Strategy Officer, Kelly Joins from Contexture, is moderating the panel. Our panelists include James Stover, who's the Arizona Medicaid President for Centene Corporation and Arizona Complete Health. Jessica Yanow, the President and CEO of Arizona Alliance for Community Health Centers and Collaborative Ventures Network. And Dr. Jeffrey Dan, the Regional Medical Director for Adelante Healthcare. So I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. They have a great panel planned and uh, share, sharing lots of insights with us on population health. Take it away, Kelly. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. <clears throat> Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, as Melissa said, um, we, we have this panel on health equity. Um, we're gonna, our panelists here are going to do an overview of what they're doing in their own organizations and then we'll move into some questions um, and answers in a panel format after that. But I wanted to get started with the definition of health equity. I think people have all sorts of different definitions and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a really great one. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and health care. Um, at the Civitas conference that Morgan mentioned, I also heard a really good analogy for, for health equity, and it was equality is making sure that everyone has shoes, Equity is making sure that everyone has shoes that fit. So with that, we'll move on to the presentations and James, you are first. Awesome, thanks everybody and nice to meet you. Um, I think the slideshow's coming up perfect and it's good news is it's bigger than I thought it would be so I'll be <laughs> able to read it with my um, aging eyes. But um, just a little bit of um, background on me. I'm James Stover, I'm the um, Medicaid president for Arizona for um, Arizona Complete Health. I'm actually a native Arizonan, believe it or not, and I want, this is my audience participation pro, uh, piece of my presentation. I'm actually from Ajo, Arizona. So how many of you in the room have heard of Ajo? Please raise your hand, I can kind of wow. see, all right? Wow. Now, how many of you heard of it because it's where you stopped on the way to Rocky Point? <laughs> exactly, right? Um, and part of the reason actually to bring that up, right, is I was obviously born and raised in a very, very small rural town um, close to the Mexican border between um, the Tono Otham um, Indian Reservation and the Mexican border. So while I was young and I moved to Tucson when I was 13, a lot of health disparities there, right? Uh, between health equity, access to um, rural health care, all of those kinds of things. So it's a really important topic to me personally because of my background and sort of where I was um, raised. Just a little bit about Centene. We're actually the largest Medicaid organization in the United States, not the largest health plan, but the largest Medicaid um, health plan in um, the United States, covering about 26.2 um, million um, individuals um, across the nation. That includes our Medicare and our marketplace as well, but a vast majority of those individuals are on Medicaid. Um, Really quickly, it's really the purpose of um, Centene as a national corporation to transform the health of the community 1% at a time. So it's really our focus. And we understand that you really have to address things like health equity and other um, social determinants of health to be able to accomplish this. We're um, in Arizona, um, where Arizona Complete Health, Complete Care Plan, um, combined with our sister agency, Care First, we cover a little under 500,000 um, Arizonans on Medicaid. So we're actually the largest of the Medicaid plans in Arizona currently. So a little bit of discussion around health equity. So I think that Kelly gave a really, really great um, overview and um, uh, definition for health equity, but really that is talking about discrimination, right? And there's a lot of things that impact health equity. So as a REBA, we're a Regional Behavioral Health Authority in Southern Arizona, and SAMHSA actually um, identifies individuals with a serious mental illness as being a health equity concern because of this stigma, the discrimination, and those kinds of things. So that alone um, is a um, health equity issue. There's also, you know, issues related to sexuality, et cetera. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to uh, focus a little bit more on race and ethnicity as the health equity issues, but just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of things that impact health equity than just race and um, ethnicity. 
And, and again, kind of going back to what Kelly said, a lot of that is discrimination in education, employment, housing, transportation, those kinds of things. So how do you address that? So first of all, the approach has to be a multi-dimensional. Um, so you have to bring the member into the discussion. So we at our organization talk a lot, of, a lot about you know, things that we can do to impact members and to help members and population health and how we drive things. But the fact of the matter is that most of us don't have the same experience as our members in the Medicaid world, right? We don't um, understand all of the challenges. We don't understand um, the barriers and all of those kinds of things. So if we're not bringing the member into the discussion, we're not really getting a full picture of what is impacting their ability to be able to have the same access and the same um, equity to health as um, everybody else. We need to make sure we're accountable, right, in the organization. We need to make sure that we're accountable and that we're driving sort of that equity um, forward and that there are, um, different roles for different individuals, and we're talking about it. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit sort of about our structural infrastructure to ensure health equity just at our um, organizational level, and then sort of how that plays down throughout the organization. One thing that's um, really exciting is Centene Corporation has really been focusing on health equity, and we actually um, have a designation um, from NCQA, we won an innovation award, and right now we're going through our NCQA um, accreditation, and we are actually seeking the accreditation that includes health equity, because it's that important to us. We wanna make sure that we sort of go above and beyond sort of the standard accreditation rules and those kinds of things, and that we're addressing the culture and linguistically appropriate services for healthcare and all of those kinds of things, so we can get that health equity designation because of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm gonna kind of, I, we have five to seven minutes, so I'm gonna hit on a lot of these things that are really um, high level, but data and reporting are a really big issue, right? So I wanna make sure that we focus on data and reporting. Um, it's really hard to address um, issues, right, if you don't have the data that sort of supports how, um, you know, what's impacting individuals. And health equity has been a really hard um, data source to get to. It's been difficult. Um, it's not reported often. It's hard to um, you know, transmit, it's hard to get. So, so one thing that I really wanna focus <coughs> on today is on the data and how we get the data because until you have the data, it's really hard to um, plan sort of on the next step and steps. And then I wanna make sure that I um, hit on a case study that shows some really positive impacts when you're putting all of these things into place. So, um, from an overall organizational perspective, we have a health equity specialist who's actually sitting here in the front row, um, right here, um, who really keeps us um, accountable as an organization around health equity, right? So it's an important topic. When you um, look at Access's strategies, one of Access's primary strategies um, for the upcoming um, several years is whole person care, right? And whole person care, I think, um, we've seen an evolution, right, in sort of um, the way we deliver health. So when I started, um, I worked at Banner University Health Plan for 18 years before I came to Centene. I've been at Centene five years. And when I started, we were the acute care plan. The Rebus did the behavioral health, right? So there was not integration of um, physical and behavioral health. So that's occurred over the past few years. Then we started focusing more on social determinants of health, you know, primarily housing, but then other things like employment, food insecurity, and now loneliness and things like that are coming into play. Health equity is kind of that next sort of step, right, um, in sort of addressing the whole person. So now we're looking at things like the social determinants, health equity being one of them, but then also how is race and ethnicity and other things <coughs> that I mentioned um, impacting individuals. Having a health equity specialist helps us um, with that because Amy is always driving sort of that health equity um, perspective in our organization. We have a health equity committee in the organization. So we wanna make sure that um, structurally we have the people and we have the infrastructure that is supporting the discussion and the focus on health equity. You know, I've skipped, I'm gonna skip back here because I know I skipped a slide. Like I said, I don't um, uh, uh, follow my slides very well even though I appreciate people putting them together. Um, so from a data perspective, we use a program called um, eTech, and eTech um, is really a 
um, data analytics tool that takes um, zip code level data, it combines it with data that we have from um, health assessments and all of those kinds of things, and it actually gives us a 99% accuracy on race and ethnicity for our, um, for, our for our members. This is really, really important, right? Because then we can use that data to be able to plan, to strategize, to have the conversations around individuals um, and, and what things that will um, need to be done. So here's, here's sort of the um, approach that we have. So we analyze, analyze the data. We're able to really sort of understand um, what the health equity or the race and ethnicity um, of the individual is. We can combine that with their um, HEDIS me metrics. We can combine that with their ED utilization. We can do all of those kinds of things to ensure that we have sort of a full picture. Then we can really strategize about what are those interventions that are going to help um, individuals with the member voice um, in mind, right? Bringing them into the conversation with that member voice. And then we can evaluate the outcomes. We can see if we have improvements. So here is um, one project um, that I wanna highlight and then I'm gonna pass it on to Jessica. It's really um, a project we did um, with um, our diabetic testing. And as you can see, and now this one's a little harder to read, um, but as you can see, um, in 2019, that's the blue line, um, we did this for um, both American um, Indian as well as um, black populations. And as you can see, they had a lower um, instance of getting um, testing than um, other individuals in other um, categories or racial categories. We um, implemented um, a variety of approaches, w meeting with um, tribal nations, presenting at um, tribal conferences, um, working in the community, inviting individuals in, in the communities to speak to us, um, doing a sp a targeted outreach and education um, related to the importance um, with groups, um, sometimes in faith-based communities, sometimes in social groups, all of those kinds of things to really impact. The results of that, you can see we had an improvement um, both in the American Indian and black populations in that um, category um, in 2020. And it was really the implementation of those strategies, but we wouldn't have been able to implement those strategies if we didn't have the data to begin with, right? If we didn't understand that there was a disparity in the population um, related to this very specific metric, we would have never been able to come up with the strategies to help impact it. So really, I think that this shows that importance. And with that, there's a lot of slides in here. I'm gonna let you look at them, but I am gonna pass it along to Jessica. Thank you, James. So you're probably all gonna hear me echo some things that <laughs> James just said, um, because we're all in this work together. Let's see if this works. Okay, there we go. So thank you for having me here this morning. My name is Jessica Yano. I am uh, the president and CEO of the Arizona Alliance for Community Health Centers and Collaborative Ventures Network. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we at the Alliance are doing um, with health centers in the state um, to, to advance health equity and um, use data to do that. So just a little bit of background about the Arizona Alliance for Community Health Centers. We are the primary care association for the state of Arizona. Every state has a primary care association. What we are doing is working to create a more just and equitable healthcare system in Arizona. Um, our vision is that um, everyone has access to, has equitable access to high quality healthcare. So um, we do that by working to, by advancing the work of community health centers, which are the largest network of primary care providers in the state. Um, the work that we do to support health centers is training, programmatic support, advocacy, and technical assistance so that health centers can do really what they do best, which is serve the community. So as I mentioned, we are the state's largest primary care network. We currently in Arizona have 23 health center program grantees that receive funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration to be community health centers. We actually just um, also had a, a look-alike designated in July, so now there's 24 health center program grantees and lookalikes. We have over 180 delivery sites in Arizona, and we employ over 7,200 full-time equivalent staff. Um, we, in 2021, served over 800,000 Arizonans. That's more than 10% of our state's population. And I think it's important to share a little bit about the roots of the health center program and movement as they relate to health equity. 
So um, the health center program began in 1965 nationally under Lyndon Baines Johnson. And um, it, it was a direct result of the civil rights movement and the recognition that people, whether it was due to race, socioeconomic status, geography, did not have um, equal access to health care or, um, or positive health outcomes necessarily related to health. And so um, in, in various places throughout the country, both in um, Boston, the Boston area is one of the first health centers, and also in rural Mississippi, um, these health centers were started really to serve the community. And I think this is where you'll hear me echo what James said, is um, health centers are required by federal statute to have a, a majority patient board of directors. And so as, as James, you talked about speaking to the members, our health centers have their patients on their boards that are able to drive what those services are, that are able to identify what those needs are in the community, um, that are able to, to review that, the data that's um, coming through the health center and make decisions about what needs to happen, whether it's clinically or programmatically, in conjunction with the leadership of the health center. And so that's a really important piece of what we do. And um, yes, of course, each health center is a very savvy um, operating primary care facility, but at the roots of that is, is that mission to improve access to care for everybody and to achieve health equity. Um, you know, I, we were talking earlier about how do you know when health equity has been advanced? Um, it's always baby steps, but um, that's some of the work that, um, that health centers do every day. Think, um, you know, when health centers first started, they were addressing social determinants of health when before that term was a term that we were using. Um, they really are rooted in the community. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. So we are a nonprofit membership organization. We receive a lot of different grants to provide various services, resources, support to health centers. But each health center is an independently operating organization. And so what, what we do as much as we can is bring health centers together to share best practices, to learn from each other, um, to provide those opportunities for collaboration. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And then um, we're lucky to have D Dr. Dan here as well, who will talk more specifically about work that one of our health centers in Arizona, Adelante Healthcare, is doing. So in terms of work that we are doing at the Alliance, we host a health center controlled network. It is a network of 22 health centers in Arizona and six health centers in Nevada with the intention of um, focusing on health information technology improvement, interoperability, um, and use of data. That's really important because, again, I'll echo James, um, we, can't, we can't determine what next steps to take if we don't have the data and if we're not gathering it effectively, managing it, able to report out on it. So that's one piece of the work that we do. Um, something else that we do is we also have um, the majority of our health centers on a population health management tool called the Zara Drives, and um, that tool is, is used by health centers for a variety of things. There's connectivity to the HIE, there's um, you know, uh, gaps in care reporting, there's uh, pre-visit planning. It's really a tool where our health centers can slice and dice, pull information, and figure out um, what actionable steps to take based on that data. So those are kind of underlying some of the work that we're doing. We're focused on social, um, social determinants of health, as one piece, and um, we've been doing that work for some time. For, for years, we were coaching our health centers to implement the PREPARE tool, which some of you may be familiar with. Not every health center is using it. Some are using different tools, but it is the piece of needing to, to understand what the situation is, to gather that data before you can determine what to do with it. And so we have health centers at different stages of gathering that data, of being able to make referrals, and not only make those referrals, but close the loop on referrals. Um, and so that is something we continue to work on. We also uh, work on, there's uh, annual reporting that our health centers need to do to the Health Resources and Services Administration as part of their funding. It's called Uniform Data System. We call it UDS. Um, the UDS reporting um, has a number of required metrics. Some are financial and operational, but some are quality metrics. And so we bring our health centers together and look at those metrics monthly. Um, so that we can understand who's doing really well in this area, who's not doing as well, what can we learn from that, what, you know, what is the data telling us that we need to look at so we can impact this differently. So that's something we continue to do. 
We also focus on substance use disorder. We were able to work with health centers in Maricopa County that are on the Azara Drive system um, to implement a substance use disorder module, which helps coordinate further things like um, diagnoses and scripts so that we have that information available when we're looking um, at the patient population. We have also continued to work for years on domestic and sexual violence um, programming to support um, folks that are, that are living in those situations. And um, through that, we've also been collecting social determinants of health data and making referrals. Um, and we support our health centers to continue to do that. In terms of chronic disease management, we've been really lucky to have a partnership with the Arizona Department of Health Services that supports us in working with health centers to identify those most at risk um, related to, to chronic disease, chronic conditions, so hypertension would be an example, and to, to do the data tracking necessary um, and identify the appropriate interventions to improve health outcomes for, for those patients. And then lastly, um, we've had an opportunity through COVID using, using data to identify areas where, where vaccination <clears throat> rates were low and work with health centers to develop um, culturally and linguistically appropriate educational information for those communities, specifically to target those communities. So um, we're excited about the work that we're doing. We recognize because we work with all health centers that everybody's in, in a different place, um, but, but all are invested in this work. And I think the, um, the other piece that's not on this slide that I would add, just as I was thinking about what you were saying, James, um, we do have an equity committee as well that is comprised of representatives from health centers across the state um, that are meeting regularly to discuss issues of um, health equity and justice equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that's something that um, is an organizational priority for us, uh, both focused internally for our organization as well as working with our health centers to ensure that um, we provide an environment where health equity is a priority. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Dan. Thank you. All right. Well, maybe. Okay, took a second. There, <laughs> uh -oh. there we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Dan. I'm the regional medical director at Adelante Healthcare, which is one of the community health centers that uh, Jessica's been talking about. Um, what's nice, I think, is we've had a really good perspective here, um, starting with um, kind of the national um, health plan, sort of big picture, uh, down to the state level, and then now down to us, who are uh, frontline providers, sort of the boots on the ground, uh, so to speak. So that's kind of nice. Um, I'm guessing it was planned that way. Huh? <laughs> But anyway, um, that's great. I uh, also want to thank Jessica for covering a lot of the stuff that's in mind, so now I don't have to explain it so we can get right through it, <laughs> so, which is perfect. Um, so first off, let me tell you a little bit about um, Adelante Healthcare. So we are a federally qualified health center. We've been around since 1979. Um, we were originally started here in the West Valley to take care of migrant farm workers. So we came from uh, kind of very humble beginnings, and over the years we've grown to a much larger organization. Um, in the, let's see, I've been there for eight years, and we have more than doubled in size in that eight years. And I don't think I was completely responsible for that, but you know, at least uh, helped with that. And um, we currently have about 85,000 uh, patients who are active. And out of those patients, about 60% of them are uninsured and Medicaid. And that works out to about 300,000 um, visits annually. Um, the services we provide, basically it's um, birth to death. So we start with WIC and then OB-GYN, PEDS, family medicine, internal medicine, uh, behavioral health, and dental. Um, here are some of the grants and community programs um, that we have that are actually um, focused on people with um, fewer resources, those who don't have insurance, um, really trying to bridge this equity gap that we've been talking about. Um, our HIV prevention grant uh, focuses on 
um, increase in testing and then getting those who test positive into care and those who test negative and are at high risk to get them on PrEP so that we can um, hopefully someday end this epidemic. Um, our hypertension uh, remote patient monitoring program, uh, this one's really cool. Um, this one, uh, we basically use a um, cellular enabled blood pressure machine uh, that we give to the patients and um, are able to um, monitor their blood pressures at home. I, I think um, you've probably all heard of white coat hypertension. Um, so a lot of people when they come into the office, their blood pressure is high, but it's not really high. They're just really anxious, uh, especially our population. Um, you know, they live in crisis every day, so just getting to the doctor's office can be um, quite a challenge. They may have had to take two buses. Um, I had a patient who I saw on uh, Friday who, who walked an hour to get to our clinic. Um, so um, it's really nice that we have this program. It helps us um, get them under better control. Um, and we use a lot of um, data uh, to sort of uh, uh, squish that uh, period. Typically when you're titrating medicines like that, it can take you um, sometimes months to get someone under control. But when we have that um, data coming in on a weekly basis, we can adjust the medicines much quicker and actually um, show that we have better outcomes. Um, our Well Woman program um, provides um, pap smears, colposcopies, biopsies, um, things like that um, for uninsured patients. Um, we are participating in the T-MIST trial, uh, which gives free mammograms to our uninsured. Um, we have a GI clinic uh, where the Mayo GI fellows actually do endoscopies and uh, colonoscopies for our uninsured patients. And then um, lastly, um, one of the big challenges with our folks is transportation. So even if we have all these services, obviously if they can't get there, it's not really uh, gonna get us anywhere. All right, so Jessica already talked about this, the um, Azara system. Um, this is very, very cool system. Um, they helped us get it, um, which is great. And um, we use this on a daily basis. So um, we have uh, pre-visit planning reports uh, that we get in the morning that have our entire schedule on it. And then um, we actually meet um, for a huddle where we have an RN, a dietitian, a behavioral health person, um, along with our regular team um, who help us look at these patients and identify um, not just things like um, cancer screenings, immunization, stuff like that, but also um, uh, SDOH um, items, whether or not they've had a prepare, um, whether they speak another language, um, and things like that. So it's, it's been a, a great uh, reporting system. So um, this is actually just an example um, and this is um, with our remote patient monitoring. So um, when it comes up on the sheet, we can actually see um, people that are enrolled. Um, we can see um, in this one, it actually tells us that their SDOH needs assessed. So we would have um, one of our um, behavioral techs go in and do the prepare tool. Um, and again, you can see it has things like they're diabetic, that their A1C was out of range. Um, they've had their COVID shot, so it, it's really a great tool um, to use on the ground um, for each individual patient. You know, your data is all looking at sort of populations of people, uh, but this is looking at each individual patient and how we can improve their situation. And that is it. Thank you, all three. And I do, I like that progression. That was really good. It was sort of planned, maybe not perfectly planned. All right, a handful of questions. Um, so Jessica, if you would take the lead and start this one, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge or the biggest challenges in achieving health equity for all? And, and, and maybe, you know, what's missing as far as policy or practice or methodology? 
Oh, I have a whole list of those. <laughs> um, so, you know, we work in an environment where um, the majority of our funding is federal. And what we find is that a lot of the policies and practices of federal agencies that are maybe working to address um, issues that, that could advance health equity are not aligned. And so that's one thing for us um, that's really important. Things like addressing social determinants of health, like housing and food security, there isn't alignment across a number of agencies that are, are actually trying to work to improve these issues. So that's one piece. I think um, underfunding of programs is always another one that, that we talk about. Um, for example, um, housing and urban devel development programs um, that disproportionately impact communities of color as well. Um, and, and often um, the people that are being served at, at health centers are the people that are impacted by these policies. Um, something that doesn't apply necessarily to our state, but on a national level, um, I would say full Medicaid expansion um, is, is a step in the right direction towards advancing health equity, um, but there are many states where that has not happened yet. And then finally, you know, I think Dr. Dr. Dan um, talked about some of the, um, the lack of resources that many of our health center patients have, and so an, an example of that would be that care delivery is transforming right now as a result of the pandemic. We've seen much more telehealth, mm -hmm. but we also see that our patients don't necessarily have the resources to connect in that way to their provider, whether it has to do with um, you know, infrastructure in their community, whether it has to do with them actually having some kind of technology at home. Um, and so that's, that's something I think that um, if we can't ensure access to those kind of resources for people, we can't advance health equity. And James or Jeff, would you add anything to that? You know, the only thing that I think I would add, I think absolutely all of those things um, are true. And then I think also, um, as we look at populations, um, like individuals who have a serious mental illness, right, we see a much higher um, homelessness instance um, mm -hmm. in the population. So when we're looking at things like health equity, it's also really um, important to take into consideration um, things outside of um, race sometimes that mm -hmm. um, impact health equity and what you're doing to sort of advance um, those types of issues, um, you know, housing, services, um, you know, the Health Plan Association, the Arizona Association of Health Plans, a um, few years ago, three years ago, got together to form um, sort of a sub-organization called Home Matters to Arizona. And what's really exciting about that is that it's all the Medicaid plans, so we're competitors, right, but we're coming together in this collaborative to really address um, the housing needs um, in Arizona. And to date, we've actually funded 10 projects and have um, added a, almost an additional 1,200 housing units um, for individuals. And, and again, they're really focused um, around healthy communities, right? So what's happened in a lot of states is you look, is they put up housing units in industrial areas. Um, so they're not close to schools, they're not close to grocery stores, they're not close to bus lines, they're not close to anything. That creates also health inequities, right? Because now you don't have um, access to transportation, you can't get um, good food, all of those kinds of things. So part of um, the reasoning to do these healthy communities is to put them, people want a home, right? They, yes, absolutely, they want a place to, you know, a house, but they really want a home. And in a home, when you think about it, you have access to all of those other things that are sort of outside of just a roof over your head. So I think it's really important to remember that when you're thinking about health equity is that you're really trying to create a healthier community which focuses on more than just a place to be able to sleep at night. Um, I would add, I was just thinking of an example. Um, when we were setting up our um, RPM program, um, the uh, blood pressure monitors come in two forms, basically. One that's Bluetooth enabled and then one that has a cellular chip. Well, with the Bluetooth one, that means they have to have a smartphone, they have to be able to download an app, they have to manually um, send it, all that kind of thing. Uh, we knew our patients wouldn't be able to do that. So even though the cellular um, ones were more expensive, uh, for our patients, they're definitely uh, what was gonna work. And Jessica, you hit on this a little bit with the makeup of the board, which I never, I, I never knew. It's really cool. But um, Jeff, if I could ask you to lead this one, um, how do you engage your members or your patients in the design of your equity program? 
So um, Jessica kind of hit yep. on it. Uh, to begin with is that um, we are designed uh, so that 50% of our board are patients. So it really does come from the top down. So that really drives um, kind of everything we do. Um, the people who um, are on the board are typically from uh, the communities that we serve. Um, they may be a couple generations removed sometimes, but they have, you know, their parents were, uh, or grandparents were migrant farm workers, for example. And so um, we, it's designed to be that way from the beginning, which is great. Um, we also um, have a patient experience uh, team that actually reaches out to our patients um, and uh, really kind of looks at what, what it is they need, really. What, um, yeah, or even just why they didn't come to their appointment. Um, did they not have transportation? Did they not have a babysitter? Did um, the uh, ride who was supposed to come pick them up not show up? So um, there's lots of, lots of things that we track and look at. Anyone else? I think I would just add to that that um, in addition to having that patient majority board, that health centers are required to do needs assessments yes, periodically, actually, yeah. and so they are digging in deep to mm -hmm. what you know what are the services available in this community, what are the needs in this community, and then going back to those boards to have those conversations and determine next steps. Yeah. I guess I'd just uh, jump in really quickly with um, so health plans um, have member advisory councils um, that really, that's what they're designed for. What I would say is the pandemic actually created a really big challenge um, in that aspect. So while I think the adoption and usage of telehealth really increased, sort of those member forums um, actually became a lot, a lot less attended from a telehealth perspective than when we were able to host them in person. So it's been more challenging to engage actually um, our members, um, as we call them in the health plan, in sort of dialogue around healthcare design and those kinds of things. Now, one strategy that we found that has been successful is we work really closely with peer and family run organizations. So if you're not um, overly familiar with peer and family run organizations, um, there are organizations um, who have um, trained peers and family members. So a peer is generally somebody who has a lived um, experience. Mm -hmm. So they um, may be an individual with a serious mental illness. They may ha have had a substance use disorder. They may have been incarcerated at some point, but they have a lived experience. Family members, um, similar, um, they have a close family member who had a lived experience. So understand at a different level than other individuals, sort of what um, the person who's experiencing this is going through. They have a really, really um, unique opportunity to engage people because yeah. they can connect with them on a different level, right, than um, some other populations. So we've had some success in engaging our peer and family run organizations and our Office of Individual and Family Affairs, who are inside the health plan, who also uh, employees of the health plan, who also have lived experience, um, to be able to engage. But it has created a challenge actually with us getting feedback from members because they're less likely to actually do that in sort of a virtual environment. And then if we could talk about data a little bit more, um, if, if we, we've talked about um, equity being determined by race and ethnicity and some of the social determinants, transportation, food, housing, um, what other types of, maybe not so obvious, but what other types of data and analytics would be so helpful if you could, if you could get your hands on it? If say, perhaps the HIE could provide it. Um, sure, I can uh, start with that one. So first of all, I think the work that the HIE is doing, and not just because they invited me to speak here, but <laughs> really um, Contexture is doing around the closed um, loop referral system and those kinds of things is very, very important, right? Because it's really giving us a much fuller picture of an individual's um, healthcare experience. And when I talk about healthcare experience, I'm talking about their um, ability to have, um, you know, uh, housing and food um, and all, nutritious food and all of those kinds of things. It's giving us a much better understanding of their complete um, experience around that. One thing that's really helpful to the health plan from a population um, perspective is the use of the Z codes, right? So the Z codes in um, coding really gives us a lot of information around um, 
individuals, um, you know, what, what's happening with them, their challenges around social determinants of health, all of those kinds of things. So um, for those of you in the provider community, I just put a plug out there that those Z codes are really, really important to us to help us understand the full picture and, and then to create strategies, right, that are gonna impact populations um, of individuals at sort of a high level and come up with um, programs that we think um, will work with um, the member voice um, in mind, of course. And then I think as we continue, the more and more we can get, I talked about um, the solution that we have that's related to using um, zip code level data combined with um, health information and those kinds of things around understanding um, individuals, um, race and ethnicity, that's really, really helpful. But the more and more we can um, get information, the more and more we can do. And a lot of times um, we just have to understand who that member connects with, right? Sometimes they connect with their provider, sometimes they connect with their, their peer um, a run person in the organization, sometimes they connect with the promotora or those kinds of things. You know, another strategy we've used is the promotoras and um, different kinds of um, community health workers and those kinds of things. But the more information we can get um, from different sources, the better we are at really understanding and being able to predict outcomes. Anything to add? I think I would add that on a, um, on a macro level, ideally a lot of the data that we would like to have is not healthcare related right. data. Um, and connecting with those other sectors to figure out how to overlay that data in a meaningful way so that we're able to look at the big picture and understand how we can make an impact for different patients and populations. I think that's, that's what, what we would like to be able to do. We're definitely not there yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think from my perspective, it it would be nice if we had more automation of some of these things. So you have very limited time as a provider when you're seeing a patient. So um, yes, it, it would be great to drop all these Z codes, but that takes time. Um, but when we have um, someone who's doing the prepare tool, that's the perfect time. Drop all those Z codes then. Um, so we need to think I think a little more strategically about how we can um, streamline things so that we capture that data better. And I mean, that, that overlay of all these different data types that are not traditional healthcare, I mean, that speaks to how complicated this is and how long the road will be. And so, so maybe my last question for you all is, um, before we go to audience questions is, what excites you about progress and what gives you hope that we can advance toward and get to real health equity? And James, if you would like to start. Sure, um, you know, so we've seen, um, I gave an example of one program, right, um, related to diabetic testing that we've been able to see um, some changes in. I think the other is really the conversation, right? So I, for um, many, many years at I think all levels, um, health plan levels, policy levels, et cetera, we didn't talk about a lot of things, right? We didn't talk about you know, people's race and ethnicity and the way it impacts um, so, uh, individuals. Yeah. We didn't talk about the social determinants of health. We certainly didn't talk about sexual orientation and all of those kinds of things. So I think the conversation and being open. So during um, the pandemic, and um, we were having an issue with um, vaccine hesitancy, like I think a lot of people did. And one thing that was really, really helpful is we were able to bring together a group of um, health experts um, from all different communities. So um, individuals from um, tribal lands and different areas in urban areas, as well as um, some individuals from the Southern Arizona um, AIDS Foundation in um, Tucson, et cetera, to really talk about why um, individuals of certain um, groups were less likely to be vaccinated. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons around vaccine hesitancy, but one of that is um, in, in sort of ingrained in a lot of people in their sort of cultural background, right? Um, and whatever that cultural background is. Conversations like that, we, in our organization, we have something called courageous conversations that's related to racism and anti-racism and all of those kinds of things. Those conversations are really, really helpful um, in being able to sort of understand. So I think what's uh, making me excited is the conversations are happening and the conversations have to happen first before you can sort of move on to getting the data and then you're getting to, um, you know, really coming up with effective strategies to impact it. Yeah, very true. I don't know 
know that I have anything to add. I think I would, I would echo that. I think starting the conversations is yeah. really important. And, and we have been doing that over the last several years, but there's more we can do. Um, but I think also for me, it's the, even if they're baby steps, seeing the progress at, from different of our health centers yeah. with, with whatever project or initiative, it's like, okay, there, there is that opportunity and how can we all learn from that and how can we scale it? Um, and so for, you know, from, from my seat, it's the, it's the opportunity to, to share across health centers, have those conversations, share across health centers, and then create something much bigger than just one individual health center. I would say um, having a population health tool that, like Azara, like mm -hmm. what we have now, uh, has been a complete game changer, really. Um, prior to having that, it was very difficult, even just at the patient level, um, to track things like what we can, with one button, pull up now and have it all right there. Um, so that, to me, is just huge, um, the fact that we're asking the questions and the data can pop right up in front of me um, in real time when the patient's sitting in front of me. All right. Anything else you want to add before we go to any audience questions that I haven't asked you? I can put you on the spot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if we have questions from the audience, we certainly have time. I know we're between you and lunch, but we certainly have time. Melissa. So I was at a conference last week in Colorado, and it was a group that uh, was from uh, facilities in rural Colorado. And um, the interesting comment was made around health equity that we're looking a lot at um, racial and ethnic disparities and how we can focus on those areas, but the differences between health equity in urban versus rural and my new term that I learned uh, uh, in Colorado is frontier, um, so even more rural than rural. Um, can you speak to any examples of either focus that you have in, in some of those differences in making sure that no matter where you live in a state or in a community that, that you have um, that equitable access? So I'll I don't know if this will fully answer your question, Melissa, but I'll just talk about a program that we've had for a long time at the Alliance um, since 2007. We've had funding from the Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women, and it's specifically a rural grant um, because it's the acknowledgement that in rural communities, access to resources for sexual and domestic violence do not exist. Certainly, they're, they're in short supply in urban communities too, but even more so in rural areas. And so, for years, we've, we've documented what the need is in rural communities in the state. Um, and those are discussions that, that we're constantly having. Um, so that's one way that we try and address those things, seeking additional funding. It's not, it's not the only way when we talk about things like um, workforce, which certainly ultimately does impact health equity for people as well. Um, our rural areas have very different challenges than our urban areas, even though right now, um, you know, workforce is in short supply everywhere. I think from the clinical aspect of it, um, I don't know if you've heard of the ECHO programs, uh, but they provide um, telehealth. Uh, it's typically, well, there's a bunch of different ones, but um, I was actually on one that was for transgender care. Um, but it's basically using telehealth to um, reach those people who are at the frontier or wherever. Hopefully they have satellite <laughs> um, internet, but um, those programs have been very effective um, really, the first one was um, with uh, hepatitis C, and that was extremely um, uh, successful. So, and I think the only thing I would add, um, Melissa, is absolutely agree. Right? Um, when you're looking at um, even when you're looking at populations of people, and you're trying to make um, some sort of predictive models around sort of what may or may not happen. If you look, let's take for instance, American Indian populations, right? So there's a very, very big difference in actually when you look at just statistics at a high level for American Indians who live in urban populations and American Indians who live on either tribal land or in more rural um, areas because there's a lack of access to care, right? So you can't, um, 
you know, make um, a general statement that, you know, X affects American Indians this way. You have to look at um, American Indian population this way. You have to look at, you know, a sort of much um, deeper level. I think absolutely um, telehealth has helped um, and actually, you know, one, if anything good out of the pandemic came, it was probably the adoption of um, telehealth. We've seen about, during the pandemic, we saw about a 70% um, uptick in wow. telehealth, but we're still seeing about a 42% um, usage, right? And before it was like 2% or something, right? I mean, it was very, very small. And that includes um, mental health, which has always been um, tough. The other thing is, is I think we always have to think about the way people expect to deliver care. Um, so I was sort of, um, you know, and I know that this isn't um, always exactly the same for everyone, but the, when was the last time any of you took in your car to get your windshield replaced to a glass center? Comes to you. Right. I, think, I think I saw one hand go up, right? <laughs> Many of us don't even shop, go to the grocery store anymore, right? Um, we, you know, we shop online and it's delivered to us. And, you know, sometimes people in the organization will say, oh, well, that's not the experience of the Medicaid member. Maybe and maybe not, you know, that's why it's so important, but the expectation around the way things are delivered is much, much different also. And in rural um, areas, I think that's really important. I was saying, um, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have seen that um, Amazon is starting to buy health clinics. And actually, my PCP is now owned by Amazon um, in uh, Phoenix. And while um, I haven't um, ordered, you know, my PCP online and he was delivered at my door the same day, um, you know, it's revolutionizing the way that people look at it. So we've actually contracted with a couple of groups, um, Spectrum Health, um, they do what are called Anywhere Care Teams. And what the Anywhere Care Teams are is they go wherever that member needs their health care, um, whether it's rural, whether it's urban. Um, they had an individual um, with an intellectual um, disability who um, needed earwax removal, but just could not get it done. They found that he was going to have um, an extraction at a dentist's office and had to be sedated for the extraction. So they went into the earwax removal at the same time as the extraction in um, Benson, Arizona, right? Which is, you know, not as rural as some areas in Arizona. It's probably not frontier, but it's rural um, for sure. So I think that we have to continue to look at the way care is delivered and how you actually um, impact it in those instances. Yeah. We've got one more question. Hey. I guess so. Uh, so I'm from Banner Health, and I heard a couple of you say that you use the prepare tool. And so one of our challenges, right, is you don't want to add this documentation burden. And so one of the things we are hoping we're going to do is have the patient do it through their portal. You know, but there's so many forms, you know, whether you're in acute care versus pop health versus our ambulatory, and we've all agreed to use prepare, but then what we've discovered, kind of, you know, we're looking at mapping of the Z codes, you've got social histories, you've got other forms that case managers, social workers are completing and documenting. So I just kind of want to see if I can get kind of your thoughts on all the different documentation, because it's great to get the data, but I just don't want to put the burden on our clinicians or providers. <laughs> well, <laughs> to the provider. I mean, that, that is the problem, right? Um, as, as a provider, I can definitely attest to that. I think, you know, what, again, I sort of mentioned this before, is we need to come up with a better way of doing that, right? So a lot of that stuff doesn't need a licensed provider, like a physician, to do that, right? So we need to figure out how to have care teams um, that can do that piece of it. So I know we're, we're at Adelante are working on a, a model that does just that. A, a centralized model, or? So um, ours is actually, we've gone away, we've tried that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're actually going uh, to what we call our pod model. So that typically has um, four providers and um, with that provider, uh, those providers, um, we have an RN, a dietitian, a social worker, and then we have um, kind of a, um, the title keeps changing, but it's basically an administrative person who does a lot of the paperwork, and then we have a behavioral technician as well, and that's the person who does um, universal screenings and um, such as you know the GAD seven and all that, as well as the prepare tool. Um, so we'll see how it works. 
right, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it, and thank you. Thank you.